You know, before I moved to Tennessee, I grew up on the prairie. Now, prairies have become popular gardening subjects. In particular, this concept of a pocket prairie, uh, which may be a term that's unfamiliar to some people. So I decided that I would come to the source and uh, ask Mike Berkeley out here at Grow Wild uh, about pocket prairies and what they are. Yeah, yeah, Troy, uh, welcome to Grow Wild. Uh, yeah, you know, we, we look at these prairies and acres and acres and, you know, in some cases square miles that we've historically have known these, these prairies of these, in these grasslands. Right. You know, but we can't do that in suburbia. We can't put that in someone's small little backyard. Sure. So, and they want to do the right thing. And we know now that, you know, the, the, the grasses are, are an important part to our pollinator gardens as well. But, right. you know, so we, we are looking at downsizing and taking the components of a naturally occurring prairie. Sure and putting it into a small uh, bed. All the plants are, are the same. The concept is the same in the fact that we don't want it too rich, there's no irrigation. In fact, it's pretty low maintenance. Mm -hmm. So we're actually talking about condensing the prairie concept down into a suburban lot size garden, if you will, a designed prairie. It's designed, and that's the difference is, you know, if you see a, a naturally occurring prairie, then you know, there's, the design is there, it's a very mosaic, and it's whatever nature has done, but it's maybe even a borderline, a little chaotic. What we're talking about in our own yards, though, is to actually put some form, some flow to it. Right. Uh, you have grasses flowing in, in, a, in a certain area, then you may have some certain forbs or flowering plants flowering in a certain area. Now, those will eventually evolve into a little more relaxed look right. you know, by reseeding and, and spreading out. But yeah, it's a little bit, you've got to think about this is that we are talking about in our own yards. Right. And sometimes just throwing out the seed and letting things go and nature taking its course that way doesn't always work, especially if you've got an HOA. Right, you know, we're talking you know, so about neighborhoods here, right. some of which are governed and some are right. not. But right. if, you, if you live in a situation where you do have a homeowners association, you know, the wilder the better is not always the, yeah. the, the right uh, solution. So you have to kind of live within the constraints of Right. Uh, if you make it pretty, yeah. most uh, most of the time the HOAs or even and just the people across the street that's sure. maybe not into it, they'll say, oh, well, I like that. I, how can I do that? Right. And I want to do that. So what we're trying to do is just, you know, we've watched over the years, uh, 25 years, grow wild. We've watched, you know, uh, how the gardening public embracing the natives and the whole concept of pollinator gardens and everything. This is going into that next level said, okay, I want that pollinator garden. I, I want it to perform, not just survive, I want it to perform, which means that the grasses and all the flowering plants have to really be pretty and stand up strong, but it's still a prairie. Right. You know, uh, you've got the you've got the, the prairie components, like you said, the grasses, the forbs, the flowering plants, those kinds of things. Right. Um, everything but, everything that, that you would have in a perennial bed, but one of the things we have to do is put more grasses in. Right. And I've always said, you so know. So tell me about that well, part of it. How do you come up with the formula, if you will, to, to get this concept and this look? Right, if you, if you can put at least 50% of the pl total plant material as grasses. Right. And I really prefer to 60 to 70%, mm -hmm. okay? And don't just go with one grass. And of course, this is all about scale too. If you've got a very large area, you can do a, a, have more diversity and diversity is a big word for this. Sure. But you could put maybe three to four other grasses, maybe a low bunch grass, like a side oats grandma, uh, the prairie drop seed. And then you can have some of the taller grasses, the medium sized grasses uh, in there with like the little blue stem and maybe even have some big blue stem that's you know towering up over your head. Right. So we've changed locations now uh, at the nursery and we're standing in front of the big prairie. Uh, yeah. This is about 14 acres. Right. You all restored this? Yes. The quick story was that this was a a hay field okay. and the locals around here knew it as a great hay field and so we thought well you know let's do the research let's build a prairie um, and we got some uh, 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 some federal assistance to do this in the WIP program and and uh, so we installed this prairie and uh, we actually went to Wisconsin and researched up there 
of how to do a prairie because mm -hmm. we didn't have a clue. And I'm really excited about how it turned out. So this would be considered a tall grass prairie. Right, and and you can people can see behind us. This is big blue stem. Big blue back stem here. was predominant. So eight nine feet tall when it's in full. Uh, yep seed. And it, and it stays this. What's cool about these grasses is that up in the middle of the winter in January, they're still standing up strong like this. Right. And the movement on a winter wind, you know, it's just amazing. And there's, you know, you can almost hear the sound. There's music that's going through the, these, these dried grasses. What you're probably going to understand also by standing here in this full sun is that one of the reasons that these grasses are standing up the way they are right. is that it's in full sun. It's in full sun. And I was just yeah. going to say, you know, we can see trees out at the perimeter of the, uh, of the, of the acreage, but one of the things that you'll notice, and if you, you drive through my home area out in Kansas, you'll see the same things. The trees are gathered down in the lower valleys where there's water and up on the high hills it's nothing but grasses and it's right. fully exposed. Right, and that's so. where, you know, and that's where we try to tell the homeowner, you know, the gardener, backyard gardener says, okay, you know, if you want that pocket prairie and you want these grasses to perform, you don't want them flopping, right. you know, make sure that you do put it in as much exposure as you possibly can, yeah. okay? Full and sun. Full sun, and lean soil. Lean soil. Oh, please don't amend no, the soil. No, overwatering and extra no, irrigation. No, 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 that's, 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 and then that's yeah. the beauty. You're talking about a garden entity that is as low maintenance that you don't water it, you don't feed it, please don't put fertilizer on it. Right. You don't mend the soil, you keep it as lean as it possibly can be. Sure. And you know, for Middle Tennessee, that's, woohoo, that's great. Right. Because we, we don't always, you know, in our backyards have the best soil and we want to put pine bark or some kind of soil amendment. Don't do that with a prairie. Right. You know, so we want to yeah, keep it. Those, those prairie plants are used to growing in tough. That's that's exactly tough climates, right. Tough tough locations. Right. Uh, the other thing too I want to point out is that you know you've got a lot of uh, grasses in here. You also have a lot of. Uh, 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 forbs, what we call the flowering plants. Sure. And, uh, you got se about three or four different asters in here. The, the purple cone flower is in here that blooms right. back in the summer. You've got some flocks, a prairie flocks that blooms only about a foot tall, uh, and that's going to be in April and May. The bees are all over it. We watched the butterflies through the summer coming in and all over it. So it's a double whammy. It's not just having the pocket prairie to have those grasses in there, and right. you know, but also to have the flowering plants in there. For most homeowners, we're probably looking at small to medium sized grasses. Most people probably aren't going to grow big blue stem that gets eight or nine feet tall. Some might. <laughs> We're probably also talking about a matrix of perennial plants, the forbs, the wildflowers, if you will, that are again, small to kind of medium in height for most homeowners situations. Are there any plants that you feel like people should avoid in oh, absolutely. A pocket prairie kind of, a, a home landscape. Right. Um, you know, that we have, uh, over the years, we've trialed a lot of these, these plants. And, you know, they probably did perform. There's no doubt about right. it. They performed. Exactly the but way they, they were supposed to. They overperformed. Sure. To keep the diversity, and I, I've always said that aggressiveness with a, any particular species doesn't always meet the diversity part that we want, okay? Sure. Because what you'll, and you probably have seen this many times on the roadside, is that maybe the Canada golden rod, a giant golden rod, is thick in there. Well, what was in there before it came in and took that over? So there's a lot of those uh, more aggressive plants. And, and oddly, a lot of the grasses that I would not use, the red switchgrass, which is probably one of the most ubiquitous ornamental native grasses around, right. is pretty aggressive in, in a, a pocket prairie. Oh. The sugar cane plume grass, which is beautiful and it towers up over our heads uh, probably would be careful when it's with that. in the right location right, is right. great but and the one that got me the most was the uh, willow leaf aster uh -huh. uh, that's a symphiotrichum praeotum and and we love it because up in november maybe even to the first of december it's still blooming it's still flowering so yeah. it's still catching the last remnants of the monarch butterfly coming in and feeding on its way south and we loved it and then we started noticing oh Oh, look, there's some over there. Oh, look, it spread. And so that's not one as much as we want it in the pocket prairie. It's not one to put in the pocket prairie because we want to continue the, the diversity. 
So for a homeowner who wants to install a pocket prairie, what is your recommendation on the number of plants that, that need to go in the ground? Right, that's, a, and that, that's a, a very good question because we don't want it chock full with so many different plants that you lose that flow. Okay? Right. Uh, so what I recommend is doing about 10 species, and these can be some selections, varieties of, of native plants, mm -hmm. 10 species for 100 square feet. Mm -hmm. So if you have a 10 foot linear bed, right. yeah, you're going to have 10 species. And that keeps that, of course, keeping in mind that 50% or more is going to be the grasses. grasses sure. So that keeps keeps you from getting too crazy with one, 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 one right. of all the other flowering plants. For inspiring garden tours, growing tips, and garden projects, visit our website at volunteergardener.org or on YouTube at the Volunteer Gardener channel and like us on Facebook.